Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift for the Giro d'Italia Stage 5 recap. What was a sleepy mountaintop finish yesterday? Well, we had a mountain in this stage, looked a bit like nothing stage. The riders made it exciting. Uh, like, I was really happy with this stage. And they're, they're weird stages because when you look at this, why have they put a 20k 4% climb? just in the middle of a flat stage, finishing in Messina where Nibali is from, uh, which is just near the Italian mainland uh, across the ocean. don't know which one. Why have they put this climb 80 k's from the finish or more where it crests, 100 k's when it crests before the descent? And it's to offer something for the not climby sprinty boys. I don't want to go that far. What would you call – because I'm not calling Nizzolo a climby sprinty boy, Benji – do we just call it a sprinter with professional competent climbing? <laughs> That's one way to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, I truly think that the majority of sprinters should get over a climb like this and a stage like this. Yes, there's going to be teams that are going to put pressure on those riders. It's going to be on the teams of those pure sprinters to try and make sure they can hold on. And yeah, some of the sprinters today, they were not necessarily holding on quite well on the climb and... They might never come back, but the stage started and we had a breakaway again. And once again, those drone hopper guys, Taliani and Bais were in there. Those were the two companions that were also in the, in the breakaway twice already before. So they're going for that classification with the most amount of kilometers in the breakaway, which is apparently going to them at the end of this Giro if they keep on doing what they're doing because they're in literally every break at this point. And uh, from that point onwards, it became clear that certain teams wanted to take it up when the climb started. And I think Alpecin was one of the climb, one of the teams that decided to hammer it at the front of that peloton early on. And were the first sprinters to drop? Was it Caleb Ewan? Cav was struggling, but holding. Then it was Ewan. Ewan struggling. And if you if you make it over the top, thirty seconds back. And that means the other teams have to coordinate and really push the descent. 30 seconds, even a minute, is recoverable. It's if you hard drop, you are going to have big, big problems. And it was Cavendish and Ewan going out the back door, whereas DeMar was a little bit later and he was able to salvage something later. And so I actually didn't really... I, I wasn't aggressive enough in the prediction of this stage yesterday and I was remiss to think that because we didn't know at the time that Moreshko had finished outside the time limit or DNF'd. This is the question, Benji. Do Alperson pace this if Moreshko is here? I think it changed the outcome of this stage because he would have dropped, but they might not have paced that early. They might not have contributed on the climb with their sprinter dropped. And then if it's one team... As we've seen with Bora for Sagan in previous years, it's really hard for one team to shoulder the burden. Or do you think they would have paced knowing Moreshko drops and go for MVP anyway? I agree with your first take. I don't think Alpecin would have taken this stage on trying to make it as hard as possible if Jakub Moreshko was still in their squad here because we know that the climb, whenever there's like a, a highway bridge on the on the parkour, he's terrified. So uh, he's likely to OTL if they hammer that climb and make it a very hard climb he's going to be the, the, one of the first riders to drop, if not the first one to drop. So they couldn't do it if Mareshko is in their team. And they couldn't even do it later, I think, if Mareshko is in their team. So Mareshko being out of their team is so detrimental to this tactic today, to making the stage as hard as possible and offering an opportunity for a rider like Van der Poel or whoever they'll sprint with at the end of this stage, depending on what the outcome of this of this act is on the climb. And yeah, I agree. I don't think they would have done this if Maresk was in this race because they wouldn't would have ridden him out of the time limit themselves, which is probably not a good thing to do if you're Alpes and Phoenix. Yeah, because then they wouldn't want to drop riders back to help him. So if he drops before Calf, he he'd be fucked. Um so yeah, that's probably a, a difference that happened. Before we get into the descent and whether DeMar would catch back on, got some LR story time for the Zwift Read, our show sponsor. I made the mistake of not using Zwift this afternoon, watching the Giro. Before the climb, I went for a, my customary hike up to where the vultures are located. It's really dusty. I slipped and I've cut my I cut my hand in half when I fell and I it's sliced it on a, a branch. So now I got a one hand that's cut in half. I have disinfected it. 
uh, or tried my best. And then the other hand, I've still got the broken finger from the, the dog that attacked us in Janvia back in January. So I basically got two hands that don't work. So now I'm going to, so you know, the answer to that, Zwift will be my go to keeping on track of my fitness goals whilst watching the Giro and staying active indoors on Zwift. If you want to check it out yourself, you can go to Zwift.com for a free seven day trial. I'll be on it tomorrow. I think I might do the Alp. I think I might just just go ahead and do that whilst watching the Giro. Uh, but yeah, any other thoughts on that climb, Benji? I think there's no real, yeah, into my shave for Binny and MVDP with Alberson made perfect sense. Yes, certainly. One thing I would note is that Quickstep made the, in my opinion, intelligent decision to leave Ballerini and Van Sevenant in the peloton while dropping all the others back for Cavendish to try and salvage what is possible. So if Cavendish, for example, is not able to come back after this climb, they've got a Ballerini for the sprint, which is, in my opinion, a good choice from that team. But yes, you're right. The descent started. We knew the gaps were pretty significant, actually, to Cavendish and to Ewan. I think the gap was at a certain point, two minutes and a half from the peloton that is now over the climb to the group of Cavendish, who is trying to come back with his entire team. And then it was Ewan, who was another two minutes and a half behind the Cavendish group. So that's significant. That's pretty significant. And it's, at that point in the race, still salvageable at some point. But you know that certain teams that are coming back towards the front, like Demar, who wasn't actually completely dropped, for example... He, he, he was only a bit behind at the top. Then he's able to come back. His team realizes that. His team realizes, oh, Cavendish is behind. Oh, my God. Ewan is behind. We've got an option if we keep this group ahead. So more and more teams decided to put a rider up ahead in that peloton ahead. I think Nizolo's Team Israel also put a rider up there. And if you've got so many people working in that front group, it's going to be so, so hard for those groups behind to actually come back. And that's when, at a certain point, we saw them giving up, right? Well, yeah, it's you need to close it within 15 minutes because you can't keep burning the guys, particularly with Ballerini ahead. Guarnieri had been dropped for by for FTJ, they, uh, Demar's last man, but the death knell for Cavan Ewan was when Demar made it back to the peloton, they were fucked because then FTJ would contribute. And, yeah, they gave up. And so it was going to be a sprint between Binium, perfect plan by Intermarche. Same with Albertson for MVDP, getting his chance at a bunch sprint that Benji's been clamoring for. Demar, Gaviria, Bauhaus can always sneak something like this. Nizzolo. So we still have guys here, just not the quickest men in the race, Cav and Ewan. And that was it. They went to the finish. As I said, on I did a video yesterday on Lantern Rouge YouTube channel on Cav winning Toronto Adriatico 2014 stage six, where there was two right-handers and they were pivotal. And here there's two left-handers, one at 1,150, one at 700 to go. Demar had the huge advantage. He then had, with no quick step, the best lead out, even without Guarnieri, and those corners were pivotal to first wheel. Talk me through Alpes and Benji. They have the most, they had probably the most rise for the lead out. I saw it like two Ks to go. We'll skip the GC riders were allowed to take the front to the three K banner. I swear I saw Alperson trying to sit behind like Bar Day with fifteen hundred left. Like and then they got detached from Debont. Debont was on the front. Like I don't know what their real plan was. I thought it would have been try to be first wheel through that last corner. I think so as well, because if you get first wheel through that last corner, you've got that that advantage on all the others who are going to try and come pass you afterwards. And it was such a such a sh- rather sharp corner that positioning there matters so, so much. And it was intriguing for me that Bardet was actually playing a role there. It looked like he was trying to help DSM with Gezbol and Dainese because they also wanted to get through that corner in first. But you're right, they got detached. And at that point, I was like, okay, how is Albison going to salvage this? How are they going to get past and so forth? But I want to ask you, what was Grupama doing at this point? Well, yeah, no Guarnieri, so it goes to third last man becomes second last man, second last man becomes last man, which is Miles Scottson, more of an engine, he's usually that 1,500-meter guy, he's second last. And then Sinkledam is the last man for DeMar, and through that last corner, they were good, but it was so sharp, as Benji said, that Scottson pulled so hard, and he is strong, he got detached with, I think, a Cofidis rider maybe on his wheel, and you could see Sinkledam for a moment because th- there was Ballerini in front. He's thinking, oh, Nizzolo, he's like, you guys close it. He did for a second, and he's like, mm, it's, it, I think if that corner was at 200, Sinkledam doesn't shut it down. 
But because it was at 650, he's like, no, no, you'll get caught. Let's just get back into good position. Incredible work from Single Dam, who has gotten older, and FDJ's train hasn't worked that well all the time for the last 18 months. But Damar is looking fucking good. He got over to press in Milano San Remo, where there was big watts from UAE. Didn't get dropped hard today, just a little bit. And yes, yeah, Single Dam closes down Scottson. Doesn't take the draft at all. Kicks again from 450. Damar, incredible patience. He, he risked it. He, he's like, I can't go too early, but he risked getting boxed in. He knew he had an avenue to the outside. If Ballerini had jumped earlier, he could have boxed in if he came up the inside, but he wasn't good enough. Gaviria coming from the left, but Damar then, I think Nizzolo had kicked and was ahead of him. Damar waited, ran, let single down run his course, and uh, yeah, opened up with like 175, 200 and wins this Giro stage. He won like four in 2020. He's won the Chiclamino then. He has looked in better shape this year than last year, climbing better, just all around better and a great result for FDJ. They didn't initiate on the climb, but they got they got back where Ewan and Cav couldn't. Winning ahead of Gaviria, Nitsolo, Ballerini, Germay, Bauhaus, Dainese, Tesfacion, Turns, Con. Sonny, what do you see from Germay, Benji? Is it as simple as you can't win six wheel on the barriers with two men on your left shoulder with 400 to go? Yeah, I think so. It's like positioning has been somewhat of an issue. I think last sprint as well, last flat sprint, and it seems like he hasn't figured out where to kind of look for the gaps and which gaps to jump into. And on the, he was blocked on the right side of the road and to the point where when Ballerini was to the right side, Bauhaus was next to him. And then he actually seemed to have touched the barrier at a certain point, which is fortunately that it didn't crash if that was actually the case. He lost a bit of uh, momentum and was a bit behind. And then by the time he started sprinting again, he tried to go past on the right side again when a gap opened up. But it's so close to the finish line that once again, he got boxed in and he kind of just gave up. And then the last 100 meters, he tried again. But in the end, it's it's not a situation from which you can really win this race if you're so boxed in. It's trying to find a gap and the gap was not there at that side of the road so i'm afraid that Gidmai's positioning for this sprint was certainly not perfect this coverage speaking of sprints is supported by gcn plus who have robbie McEwen on site as a pundit australia's greatest ever sprinter maybe the uh, yeah one of the greatest sprinters in history you can watch every kilometer live and ad free of the Giro d'Italia on GCN plus who have live rights worldwide, excluding New Zealand catch up when it suits you with full stage replays on demand highlights and that analysis from the likes of McEwen during and after the stage, all LRCP listeners from the U S UK, Australia, Canada, Germany can get 25% off an annual GCN plus subscription by heading to GCN.eu slash LRCP in the description down below. MVDP Benji gave up at 500 after his team had worked a lot today. Is he just not a bunch sprinter? Is it a like what? What do you see? He didn't even contest when he just he knew he couldn't win. It kind of feels sometimes like he spends too much energy in the run up to the sprint, and then is not really there at when the Agreed. sprint starts. And we see that today when he's, uh, I looked from the front on shot and I think it's still 300, 400 meters to go. And we see him on the right side of the road, basically in the wind riding for a bit. So at that point, you're like, okay, he's not going to do anything. And then he kind of disappeared. Yeah, it's, I don't necessarily see him as not a bunch printer. I think he can actually do it if he plays his guard ride. But it seems like he hasn't figured out the positioning for a bunch print to spend as little as possible before they get to the actual sprint portion of the sprint. And because of that, He's just not there, but yeah, I think in the run in Alpecin made mistakes already, and that's why he wasn't in the position in the first place. And then trying to save it from the position that he was in wasn't necessarily the thing that could happen anymore. So I don't know. It just wasn't uh, there for Alpecin today. After working all day, I do. Yeah, I, I I would be a bit pissed if I was a teammate. I was like, come on, man. You could have at least tried a bit more. <laughs> yeah, and they don't have Jonas Rickard who's their best lead-out man, one of the top three lead-out men in the world, last man. DeBont was, yeah, they got Krieger, he's fine. Uh, Modler, they let go, he was sprinting for 15th for Bardiani. Um, but yeah, he just, as you said, makes a lot of mistakes in the run-in, so did the train, spends a lot of energy. And when you're not sprinting against Simon Clark and Rigoberto Uran, it's impossible to win. 
uh, even though Amstel World Race 2019 was insane. But nonetheless, a really a much better stage than it could have been. The riders made it, and I'm really happy about that. Tomorrow, from Palmi to Scalia, Riviera de Cedri, 192Ks, kind of similar. We have not as long a climb. I think it's like 15Ks. The first half of it's not really categorized, but the second part's 4Ks, 3.7%, but I think it's a bit steeper than that in parts. That crests with 140Ks, no, more, 160Ks to go, and then there's a couple of rollers short short climbs with like 60 and 40 k's to go i'm i'm gonna go ahead and repeat what i said yesterday benji i think this is too soft to drop like you and in cav really should not be dropped on that climb and unable to come back but next to that i also want to add that alperson played their cards today and vanderpool didn't even like properly contest the sprint will they invest the entire day again to try Great and do point. that again and that's where i'm like that's where i'm like probably not so True. it will have to come down to an anton mache perhaps a, a group Bama is more confident in them are now and while he might drop on the climb they might try and make it a bit hard to make sure the others drop first and then try and make a similar situation like today happen it's a it's a bit risky you know for group Bama to make the race themselves hard knowing that demar will drop eventually just so that you and then gav drop earlier in the hopes that demar can still win the stage but who knows at this point they've got all their riders in function of Demar and they've got Walter there. So I guess just let Walter in the peloton and let the, let the others try something and see what they can force with Demar on the stage. Like I, I would try it at this point. Like why not? Walter should probably pace the climb for them. Um, I would say I I think this climb suits Demar more. Twenty k is four percent is long. This is more Chipressa territory. Uh, it's longer than that, but I think this suits Demar more. I think I you have to try. They have to because if yeah. you and, and Lotto were demoralized and Cav, like we said yesterday, maybe Quickset were being smart, thinking if the time cuts forty five minutes, why am I in a rush to finish Etna with thirty minutes? And like maybe they did that. Maybe Cav's climbing like absolute shit and. They could drop him tomorrow if they really put it down. And again, what you said about NDP, does that apply to Intermarche and Binny? And I think sixty so. Ks, sixty-five Ks, it's a lot different to 160. Yeah, that's true. I agree with that aspect. And I think the fact that it's so far from the finish line here, it's further than on today's stage, that will influence a lot when it comes to the decision making of teams to jump into the stage with the mindset of let's make it as hard as possible here. But are you worried with the climbing? that we see from you and Cavendish that they might be OTL on the Blockhouse stage? Blockhouse is pretty hard. It's, yeah, I, I hope <laughs> no not. Shit. I hope not because you know, I want them to make through the first rest day. It will really suck for the sprints in the second week. Uh, of course, they will leave after 13, but yeah, I really, really hope not. Um, maybe the break wins or I don't know. I don't know. What about break tomorrow though? Is it... Because a, a decent break can form on that climb. It's early. Like, you could have some decent climbers in there. Magnus Court? Is this a Vuelta Magnus Court type from a Bagioli Simmons reduced group of six guys? That's what I could also see possible. I think Court will try. Ooh, it's a, it's a good possibility, but... Ah. I think this is I think this is just going to be a, a sprint at the end of the stage. There's going to be enough teams that will be present at the top of that bay major climb in the peloton that will want the sprint from this. Yes, there's two smaller hills in the parkour later or a few smaller hills, some rolling hills in there in the last 70-ish kilometers, but those are not insane enough that I can see everybody really having trouble here. So I think that teams like in Israel and so forth will try and force a sprint if they see that a Cavendish and a Ewan are, are dropped definitely on the climb, then they might try and use that, but even if they're not dropped, that's even more teams that will try and get a sprint out of this. So I'm leaning more towards sprint personally, to be honest. I agree. I think it's like 85-15 sprint. Uh, Lotto Sudal have tweeted that Ewan said he had to change a wheel at the base of the climb today, Oof. which is, that he said, and I agree, the worst possible timing. So that can't have helped that being... Because like he, sh he shouldn't be behind Cavendish. Like he climbs yeah. better than or as good as Cavendish. So I think that has to be true. Uh, nonetheless, 
but that that's better if if that is the case. Even more likely to make it. I still think Worlds for you and Australian whoever the selectors are. It's like come on, we need to go with Stora, Haig, um, Matthews. Yeah, we need we need to make the race really hard. We can't. Get 11. Let's not. Who else? Legit, Cadell. He would win this. If it was, <laughs> he would win that. Maybe even five years ago. It might be a bit late now. Um, but yeah, we've got to make the race hard. I think Caleb to Worlds. Let's just say what it is. Let's not not try. But any other news from the Giro, Benji? Any other funny things? What are you doing? You haven't explained where you are. Explain yourself. What are you doing? I'm currently in what is called the Sport House Group, which is basically also in like the uh, uh, it's like a company in the building of Flanders Classics. So. I haven't run into Thomas van den Spiegel of Flanders Classics yet, but he just told me that he's around, so I might eventually. I'm here for a, a Flemish podcast, and uh, it should be a fun podcast, so I'll give it a go and see how my Flemish is, because uh, that's something I'm not yet comfortable in. I'm talking in English on this podcast, and despite being Flemish, I'm more comfortable in English. And uh, yeah, that's why I'm here, and that's why there's so much lighting behind me in all the windows, because I'm basically in a in a bowl of glass at this point. But hey, it's... Uh, it's been a long trip to get to Brussels, but hey, I'm here on the podcast, and I it's wouldn't. It's been a long this trip to get to Brussels. Get fucked. Yeah, it was two hours. You mate. live in Flanders. <laughs> I had to go from Budapest to the Pyrenees. Without, what are you talking about? I had to go from Australia. <laughs> it's a long trip to Brussels. Come off it. Actually, where is Brussels? Is it? It's like the border state, right? It's like it's like an hour and a half ride, mate. Come on. Yeah, yeah, true. That's quite pretty long. Um, all right, I'll allow it. Anyway, Benji's off doing that today. Make listen to that and let me know. Does Benji sound any different in Flemish? Because obviously, my Flemish isn't good enough. Robin McEwen speaks Flemish. Maybe he'll listen on GCN Plus. Make sure you check that or get a GCN Plus subscription if you want to watch the race, the Giro live tomorrow. Thanks as always to Zwift, our presenting sponsor. I'll be on Zwift for the next week or so because my wife is very cranky that I've injured myself again. So <laughs> safety first. I might get my quick step safety joggers on. Um, and yeah, that's all I have to say. I'm rambling and hopefully Ewan gets a job done for uh, Lotto today because they'll be pretty dispirited, I think. Anyway, that's all from us. We'll see you tomorrow. Ciao.